So the third major thinker we're going to talk about is Max Weber. Uh, and, you know, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim tend to be a kind of a holy trinity of thinkers. I'm going to add to this um, a series of other people, the boys, for example, Jane Addams, in part to bring in the voices of people who are not just like European old men, um, but to think a little bit about how um, African-American scholars were really essential to the foundation of sociology, as well as um, uh, uh, women like Jane Addams, who is really the founder of social work. But Weber um, is writing after, well after Marx um, and is doing some of the same kind of work that, um, uh, that Durkheim was interested in, which is work that seeks to um, uh, uh, create a foundation of sociology as a science. And so, you know, today we're going to focus on just two features of Weber. Um, uh, uh, the first is Weber's methodological approach, which is going to be a little different than Durkheim's, actually quite different. And then his idea about how it is that values influence behavior. So I'm going to juxtapose Weber with Durkheim in relationship to his methodology, what he thinks about how it is that we should study things. And I'm going to contrast him with Marx in terms of his ideas of what influences our behaviors. And to be very give you a quick summary, and then I'll return to the core of the, the ideas. In the first thing part, Weber is going to argue against Durkheim to a degree that, you know, individuals um, uh, are really essential to understanding um, uh, 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 behavior. So whereas Durkheim is going to be, is going to say like, we shouldn't really be taking the individual as a unit of analysis. Weber is going to say, actually, we should. Um, and, and he's going to give us good reasons for why we should. And then uh, the distinction with Marx is that um, Marx argued that we should look at the ways in which things are produced, and that determines all kinds of other things in a society, so economic determinism. And Weber is going to say, no, that's not right. Actually, the economy, and in particular capitalism, emerged out of a set of values. So the economy is not the thing that produces our values. Values can be things that produce our economy. And I'm going to use this from his classic text, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Another way of putting that is that for Marx, the argument is that the mode of production produces the culture. That is, the culture of a society is produced by how it is that we produce things. So the economy determines our culture. Weber is going to say, I don't think that's right. I actually think that the culture produced the economic relations. Now, this may seem like a really academic debate to you, but as it turns out, it's going to be pretty important um, for how it is that we understand the workings of a society. So I want to go into each one of these in turn. But first, what does it mean to take the individual as your fundamental unit of analysis? So Faber argued for um, what we refer to as methodological individualism. Um, and Faber argued for methodological individualism not by saying that actually we're all individuals and, and individuals are driving behavior. But instead, he said, methodological individualism is a good assumption to make across which we will compare it to what it is that we observe. This is a little complicated, but I don't think it's, it's not that, it's not that complicated. It's sort of like, Weber was like, you know, I'm not going to argue that individuals are strictly the engines of their own behavior. I don't believe that to be the case. But I think that in order to have a strong science of society and how societies work, we should begin from this assumption and then study the deviations from the assumption. You can think about this as like a compass, where Weber is interested in having a true north that helps us guide what it is that we, how it is that we move about our analysis. The true north doesn't mean that we only walk north. We could walk northeast or east. We could walk to the south. 
We could walk to the Southwest. We could walk anywhere. But we need to know what North is. Like, we need to know what a core assumed direction is so that the other trajectories that we take exist in comparison to or in relationship to it. And so Weber says, our unit of analysis should be the individual. And we, what this allows us to do is better understand deviations from that assumed beginning position. And so we need to place the individual at the center of our analysis and individual actions at the center of our analysis from a methodological perspective. So where Durkheim says to us, we want to look at these social forms, these you know, abstract forms of which every instance adheres to either in a normal or a pathological way. Faber says, now, you know, I don't want us to proceed in that way. Instead, what I think we should do is take individual behaviors as the foundational units of our analysis and assume that actors are acting themselves as individuals in order to produce a set of things and then see the instances where that works or doesn't work. Faber then defines methodological individualism as what he calls an ideal type. And when you hear people talk about Weber, they'll often talk about ideal types within Weber. And ideal types are not actually the perfect, I mean, not actually the, a particular instance of a thing. It's the ideal representation of that thing. It's actually not that far away from Durkheim's idea of a form where there's no pure type, uh, there's no actual pure type in society. There's no instance of a perfect representation of a type. But there are ideal, or what he calls also pure. So in the, in the, in, in the, in the, uh, this comes from a classic book that Weber wrote called Economy and Society. And he says, these are ideal types or pure types. Pure types do not exist. They allow us to think about categories of things and to compare across cases. Methodological individualism, Weber says, is an ideal type. It's an ideal type of action. And people engage in other kinds of action that deviate from this. But it's a really useful way to go about studying a society. So the first thing to know about Weber is, I mean, maybe it's not the first thing, but it's an important thing to know, is that Weber is also interested in a, a, the science of a society. Um, he identifies as a sociologist. He's deeply engaged in a historical analysis. And um, he takes methodological individualism as his ideal type of analysis. That does not mean that it's the, it is an ideal analysis in the sense of it's what we should all be doing. Instead, it's this is a good conceptual framework around which we can base analyses and compare deviations from it. And the deviations are probably many and frequent, but like our compass, it's our north so that we know where we are. And we need to set that north. And the north isn't the perfect direction. It's not the correct direction. It just makes direction possible. So methodological individualism for Weber makes analysis possible. So Weber is going to take as his core units of analysis often individuals and their behaviors. And in particular, how those behaviors, like any sociologist, may be influenced by a range of uh, social factors. Weber also places at the center of his analysis meaning-making. So for Weber, he says, we need to look at individuals and the meanings that they make of their own behavior. So we need to look, on the one hand, at what it is that people are doing. But on the other, Weber says, we also need to make sense of the subjective meaning that they assign to that behavior. How it is that we as beings create meaning systems. And that those meaning systems are essential to understanding us as humans in the world. 
So um, uh, Durkheim is going to have some similar things about the importance of meaning, but it's important to recognize that we as humans are sort of like beings that are deeply, deeply committed to ideas of meaning, of things that are meaningful for us. And this gets us a little bit beyond just an economic analysis or an analysis of how things are produced, but also helps us think about the meaning that we assign to that production. In some ways, this isn't so far away from Marx because Marx, in his interest in alienation, is in part telling us that we should be interested in the meanings that people get from their work, but it goes much, much further with Weber, where subjective meaning becomes an essential element of socioanalysis, so that sociologists need to think not just about what people do, but they need to think about the meanings that they assign to their actions the meanings that we say, like why it is that we're doing what it is that we're doing and why it is that it's meaningful for us. Because that sort of inner psychic meaning process or that collective meaning making process, so either inner psychic meaning the meaning that I assign for myself in terms of why something is meaningful for me or a collective meaning making process, which is one that we work with other people to generate meaning is essential to understanding any kinds of actions in the world. So I want to walk quickly through an example that we will return to, as I said, again and again in this class. Um, And it's one of the sort of classic accounts that Weber gives of what's referred, what's, what's titled his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. I want to take one step back first and say that uh, this book, uh, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism is absolute classic in sociology, one of the kind of foundational texts that gets taught to people in almost every theory course that they take, and usually in an introductory course, are introduced to the ideas. Um, What's not discussed as much is that how this book existed in a trilogy of books. So it existed in relationship to two other books that uh, Weber wrote, one called Religion in China, and another that was also about religion in India where Weber did a comparative analysis of the roles of religion in social development and transformation in different national contexts. Weber was a comparativist, somebody who looked across different uh, historical cases across the world to try and understand the trajectories of societies and the current um, uh, state of societies. So, One of the things that really was interesting to Weber, and this is going to return us to that big demography graph that we saw, I'm going to return to that graph again and again and again, is that the massive rise of population in um, the world um, that really starts accelerating through the um, uh, 1600s, 1700s, is also a moment of what's sometimes referred to as the Great Divergence. And the Great Divergence is the moment at which Europe begins to diverge from the rest of the world in its overall economic development. And a question that we ask is like, why is it that Europe began to diverge from the rest of the world in um, the 16 and 1700s and have this massive period of economic growth and wealth production? So, What explains this great divergence? How can we make sense of it? And almost all scholars, um, Weber and after, have identified capitalism as one of the central things that helps explain that divergence. So the reason that Weber writes about China and India, in addition to um, uh, Northern Europe, is that, you know, up until 1800, the Chinese economy was the dominant economy in the world. I mean, um, periods in time where in terms of global GDP, China probably was responsible for 25% of it in some time periods before 1800. And the Chinese economy, you know, was like the globally dominant economy for millennia. Um, We need to remember that like, why is it that Columbus sails uh, to go and eventually, you know, discover the new world. Well, it wasn't to discover the new world. It was to get to China. 
that was the primary interest. And the reason Columbus is trying to get to China is because this is a little bit of history that might be, you know, interesting to many of you that um, the Byzantine Empire collapses in the 1430s. And the Byzantine Empire is the empire that basically controls the area that today is Turkey and, you know, areas of the Middle East. Um, and for centuries, goods traveled overland from China in through towards um, uh, uh, Constantinople or Istanbul today into Europe. And so there was this massive flow of goods from China and India into Europe, primarily through the Byzantines. The Byzantines collapse and the Ottomans take over. The Ottoman Empire then takes over in 1432. One of the things that the Ottomans do is they don't quite shut down what we refer to as the Silk Route, this route of trade, but they begin to make it really expensive. So the Ottomans start to extract way more value from this trade, and it becomes decreasingly worth it for Europeans to actually trade via Constantinople, Istanbul, and the Ottomans. And so what do they start doing? They start sailing. They start sailing south and west in the hope of getting to China to avoid what's referred to in the historical literature as the Ottoman blockade. But what this should bring to mind is that, like, actually, the Chinese economy was one of the most important things for the wealth of European merchants, and it was because it was so huge. But the Chinese economy collapses in the early 1800s, um, and there's this huge divergence beginning really around 1650, maybe a little bit before then, where Europe begins to move away from the rest of the world, not just China and India, but the whole rest of the world, and become fabulously wealthy. And so what explains this great divergence? And the explanation is generally capitalism. Now, for Weber, he's interested in where capitalism comes from. Marx has an explanation. Marx says feudalism collapses and capitalism emerges from its ashes. And, you know, capitalism emerges in part from the class conflict that defined feudalism. Weber is not going to be satisfied with that. And Weber is going to note that when capitalism emerges, it emerges in really particular places. It doesn't emerge everywhere in Europe. It only emerges some places in Europe at first. And the places that capitalism emerges in are places that are Protestant or places that have a lot of Protestants. And this gives Weber a kind of kernel of insight that there may be something about Protestantism that leads to the emergence of capitalism as a system. And so Weber writes this book, which is called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And this book is going to argue that the values that Protestants hold influences the ways in which they work economically or the ways in which they organize their economic life. And as I said at the beginning of this lecture, this is in stark contrast to Marx. Marx is going to say the way in which you work and the way in which you produce and distribute goods produces your values. The economy determines all. Weber's going to take a different approach. And he's going to say, no, 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 no. Actually, I think that your values can produce the kind of economy that you have, that the sets of value commitments, ethical, um, moral commitments ha can have large consequences on economic relations. So here's how Weber's argument goes. And I'm going to do a very quick version of this. And um, um, there's much more to it than I'm able to, going to be able to cover in the next, say, five minutes. But we'll build on this over the course of the lectures. So how does this go? Well, um, Weber says, there's something really interesting about aesthetic Protestantism. So this Protestant movement away from Catholicism. Catholicism is um, an organizational structure of religion wherein people have mediated relationships with God. In other words, if you are a Catholic and you are trying to, you, you, the way in which you relate to God is through the church. So the church mediates your relationship with the divine. And this happens in a host of ways. Um, priests basically are the critical intermediary between the congregation and God. If I sin 
in Catholicism. What do I do? I go to a confessional. I go into a confessional where I sit down with the priest and I say to the priest, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And that says like, you know, can you forgive me, priest, for I've sinned. And then I tell the priest what I did. And then the priest, as God's representative on earth in some ways, tells me what to do in order to absolve myself of that sin. So in Catholicism, that would often mean something like, say some Hail Marys or Our Fathers. So I need you to say a series of things, and then God will absolve you of this sin that you have committed. And this mediated relationship with God gives the church an enormous amount of authority. Um, But it also means that individuals are kind of like parishioners, people within the church, you know, are roughly free to do what they want and also enjoy life in particular kinds of ways that maybe they won't be in other instances. They may be able to sort of represent their own success through elaborate homes and beautiful buildings. But Protestants and the Protestant Reformation begins to challenge this idea of this mediated relationship with God through the church and develops a conceptualization that's often called a personal relationship with God. So a personal relationship with God is one where it's not mediated through the church, but instead I develop an individual level relationship with the divine, with God in Christianity. So if you ever hear somebody talk about their personal relationship with God, it almost always means that they're a Protestant. Now, what does that personal relationship with God look like? What does it mean? Um, Well, in Protestantism, one of the things that it meant was the emergence of um, uh, 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 translations of the Bible into languages that people actually read. So this was a critical feature of the emergence of Protestantism was that Germans could read the Bible in German, the English could read the Bible in English instead of encountering it in a language they didn't speak or they only spoke poorly or because they were highly educated. Within this Protestant movement, there's a critical person called Calvin. Calvin begins to preach a particular kind of um, uh, form of, of, of Christianity where he says, you know, this idea that God can absolve you of your sin through acts that you do is kind of absurd. So that you can like sin and then enter into a bargain with God. Like I can make up for that sin by doing the following things is really strange. And part of the strangeness of that position, according to Calvin and other thinkers was, why should God be beholden to your will, right? You can choose to do something to absolve yourself of that sin or not. In that case, like God is subject to your own will. That doesn't seem to make any sense, says says Calvin. If God is an omniscient, all-powerful creature, we as humans should not be able to will ourselves into the grace of God. More importantly, God should have known from the start whether or not we would do that thing, whether or not we would actually take the actions to absolve ourselves of the sin. God knows from the beginning. So it's absurd to think that through our own acts, we earn God's graces. Because if we can earn God's graces through our own deeds, God is subject to our will, and God is not subject to the will of man. God always knows. This leads Calvin to make an argument about predestination, that we are actually predestined to be saved or not. In other words, nothing we do in life produces our salvation. God knows from the beginning. He is all-powerful and all-omniscient. What Weber notes is that this doctrine of predestination creates a very peculiar feature in how it is that people organize their lives. If we are a community of Calvinists, of believers in this, we are suddenly confronted with a challenge, which is that, like, there's nothing we can do to earn God's grace. We either are saved or not. It's predetermined. It's, It's happened before the even moment of our birth. So how do we know that we're saved? 
Well, one of the things that we do is we create indications that we're saved, marks of the elect. And one indication that we're saved is our own success on earth, that God shines brightly upon us. So we have this big drive to be successful, in part because we're in communication with both ourselves and whether or not we're saved and other members of the congregation. And so we try to produce this sense of our own salvation. But there's a second part of Protestantism. It's not just that we try to produce the mark of being an elect. It's also that we have a prohibition from enjoying that the fruits of our own success. Part of the idea of Protestantism is a this-worldly denial, a denial of the present enjoyments of life because the reward comes after life. And so instead of like being successful and then enjoying our success by spending money, buying a nice house, we, we, just, we just are successful. And so what this leads to is a drive for people to be very successful, but instead of spending the money that they make, they reinvest it. And then they reinvest it. And then they reinvest it. And Weber argues that this ideological framework serves as the basis of capitalism. The people have always had the drive to success. But one of the curious things about Protestantism is that they have that drive to success and then deny themselves the ability to actually make more money. So this then is the beginning of Weber's argument of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. We will return to this argument in subsequent uh, lectures to sort of get a richer sense of the relationship between religion, um, and in particular Protestantism and capitalism.